If you haven't done so yet, make sure that you pause the video and give the question a try on your own first before listening on. In part A, in order to show that the electric field at the center of this triangle is zero, what we want to do is draw the electric field vectors that are produced by these three positive charges. Now we recall that for a positive charge, the electric field produced by that positive charge will point away from that charge. And so when we draw these electric field vectors, we have to make sure that they're pointing away from the positive charges. So for example, if we look at the electric field that this positive charge is producing at this point right here, we have to make sure that we point our electric field vector away from that positive charge. So our arrowhead should be pointing downward. The electric field produced by the charge in the lower left of the triangle is also pointing away from that positive charge, and so we should draw an electric field vector pointing away from it. And we want to draw the vector so that it's the same size as the arrow that we had drawn for the other electric field. And the reason for that is because both charges have the same magnitude and they are both located the same distance to this point in the center. And so the electric fields will have the same magnitude. The third charge in the lower right corner produces an electric field pointing away from that charge. Again, this electric field should have the same magnitude as the other two. So these would be the three electric fields. And we can label them perhaps just E. Now what we want to do is go at that point in the center of the triangle and superimpose a y-axis as well as an x-axis there. And the reason that we want to do that is because we have to break these electric field vectors into their x and y components, which we will be organizing in this chart over here. And if you notice, we went ahead and labeled the electric fields actually E1, E2, and E3, because although their magnitudes are the same, their components will actually be different. So labeling them E1 through E3 helps keep track of them. Let's start with E1. What we want to do is break E1 into its x and y components. Now the x component of E1, we could show by this pink vector, and that would be pointing to the right, and then its y component would be pointing straight up. And in order to find those components, we need to know this angle right here. Now, we know that this angle here is 30 degrees. And we know that because an equilateral triangle forms a 60 degree angle, and this line that's drawn is bisecting that 60 degree angle, so that will make it 30. Well, if that angle is 30 degrees, then this angle right here is 30 degrees because it is what we call an alternate interior angle. And if that's 30 degrees, then looking vertically over to here, we have this angle that will necessarily be 30 degrees. And so if this is 30 degrees, then the same argument will allow us to conclude that this is 30 degrees right here as well. So for the x component of E1, notice that it is adjacent to that 30 degree angle, whereas E1 itself is the hypotenuse, and adjacent in hypotenuse will allow us to use the cosine function, therefore, to represent the x component. Furthermore, notice that it's pointing to the right, so it's going to be positive. So we come over to the table, and we can write that the x component of E1 is going to be positive E1 times the cosine of 30 degrees. Remember, we're using cosine because that x component was adjacent to the 30 degree angle. The y component, however, is opposite to the 30 degree angle. And once again, E1 is the hypotenuse, so the trig function that relates opposite with hypotenuse is sine. And it's pointing upward and is therefore positive. So the y component will be positive E1 times the sine of 30 degrees. Now a similar line of reasoning will allow us to find the components of E2. We could draw them if we wish. We have the x component pointing to the left and the y component pointing up. Because the x component is pointing to the left, it's actually going to be negative. The y component is pointing up, so it will be positive. So for E2, we can say that the x component is negative E2 times the cosine of 30 degrees. And then for the y component, it's going to be positive E2 times the sine of 30 degrees. Now finally on to E3, and E3 is pointing straight down. 
And because it's pointing straight down, it has no component along the x direction, so we can fill 0 in for that component in the table. And then the y component would be the entire magnitude of this vector. It's pointing down, so it'll actually be negative. So we can come in here and write negative e3. And once again, because that entire electric field vector is along the y direction, we don't actually have to break it up into a component per se using sine or cosine. It's just the full value of E3. Now, what we're going to do is add the x components together. And what you're going to see is that they're going to cancel. And the reason is that, remember, the electric fields themselves, the magnitudes, E1, E2, and E3, they're all equal to each other. The directions are different, but their magnitudes are the same because each charge is the same distance from the center of the triangle and each charge has the same amount of charge. And therefore the electric fields will all have the same magnitude. So now we can actually come back in here and erase the subscripts one and two because the magnitudes are all the same. And when we add the x components, we can see that the positive and negative e cosine 30, they will cancel. So this ends up being 0. And then because the sine of 30 degrees is equal to 1 half, what we essentially have is 1 half e for this y component, another 1 half e, and then we have this negative e. Now, of course, 1 half e plus 1 half e will make 1 e. And when we combine that 1 e with this negative 1 e, those will cancel out as well. So because the sum of the components in the x direction and the y direction is zero, then the net electric field at the center is also equal to zero newtons per coulomb. So we have finished part A of this problem. Now for part B, we need to find a symbolic expression for the electric potential. Now the electric potential produced by a point charge is symbolized by capital V and it's equal to K times the charge divided by the distance from the charge to the location of interest. Now in this case, the electric potential produced by this charge right here would equal K times Q divided by the distance from that charge to the center of the triangle, which is marked as being A. Now in fact, that's going to be true for not just this charge, but also this charge and this charge. So the total, which we can symbolize by sigma V, would simply be this expression added together three times. Or you could just multiply it by three. Notice we're not breaking it up into components because electric potential, unlike electric field, is a scalar quantity. So that means it doesn't have any direction and you therefore don't have to break it up into components. You can simply algebraically add the quantities together. And when you do this, you're going to get three kq all over the common denominator A. So this will be the correct answer for part B. And then for part C, in order to explain that the electric potential is not zero, even though the electric field is zero, we kind of almost explained it already. Remember, the electric field is a vector quantity. So when vectors are arranged in the appropriate manner, as they were in this problem, the net resultant vector can oftentimes equal zero because the directions cancel each other out. So the x direction was pointing to the right for this vector, and the x direction was pointing to the left for that vector, so they canceled out. And then the two upward y components were canceled by the downward vector for the other electric field. So basically, with electric field, they're vector quantities and can therefore cancel. But the electric potential doesn't necessarily have to cancel out because it was computed using all positive values. So when you add together a bunch of positive numbers, you certainly don't get zero. An additional explanation is presented on the screen. Rather than read it to you, I'll ask you to pause the video and read it to yourself for a couple of minutes and see if this makes sense. So this would be an alternative explanation. If you have any questions about it, let me know in the comments and I'll provide clarification.